Um, so, uh, again, I think you know me already. I'm Daza Greenwood, for those of you that are um, new here. And um, this panel is on automated legal entities and autonomous legal entities. We're going to be digging deeper now into one of the international principles that Silk brought up. DAO should have legal personality. That's another way of saying it should be like a corporation. You can sue and be sued, form contracts, hire people. Um, so let's let's um, let's dig into that. Um, why don't you won't you join me on the on the couch area? Here's fine. Um, so um, I I want to get us started, uh, and then um, and then one of you go. Um, so this will be mostly a um, discussion with people. Uh, we hope, but um, just to frame to set the table a little bit. Um, the question here is how can software like how can a DAO, for example, or other automated software um, constitute a valid legal entity? So one of the principles was, was that it could be liable. In order to be, for anyone or anything to be liable, it has to be a legal entity. So like a poem can't be liable, or an idea can't be liable. It, like a script I just wrote in JavaScript can't be liable even if it does something to incur liability, that incurs liability. There's legal parties are required to be um, named in a lawsuit uh, and in order to be sue or be sued. Um, so if humans, so here's some of the questions that this is raised. Um, if humans are in the loop for key approvals, decisions, or other actions, what aspects of the entity could or should be achieved through automated processes? So what's the relationship between humans and the software code? We have a concept um, that Silk just brought up of, a, of like a participant that has an address. Um, are there other roles that one could imagine? Um, a, another way to say that would be, if you looked at all of the functions and actions that a legal entity must take at minimum, must be capable of taking, like it has to be capable of signing something, it has to be capable of um, having process served on it, like a legal notice. Which of these functions right now can, can be or should be achieved by software? And which ones can or should be achieved through humans that are acting as agents for the software? Or the other way, there's, and then I guess I'll say this, there's kind of three ways people have talked about this. One of them is that the software is sort of an AI and it can contract with humans to act as its agents. The other way to look at it is you have humans that are like the board of directors and they're operating through the software. So the company or the firm is software. And another way to look at it, which um, is gonna be represented on our panel, is that the software itself should be a legal entity. It's a, that's a little bit edgy, and so it's, and, but it's not unprecedented in the law. So for example, in maritime law, um, for various purposes, a ship um, has been considered a legal entity. Um, if you look back in maritime law, um, that's not unprecedented. Obviously, corporations are considered legal entities. They're um, legal persons. Um, and <clears throat> the other thing I was going to say is um, one of the outputs of this panel and of our brainstorming together is um, a continuing conversation with the National Association of Secretaries of State. That's a U.S. Um, a, um, organization where all of the elected members, where all of the members are elected Secretaries of State. And in the, the United States, um, they're the um, statewide elected office that's usually responsible, almost exclusively responsible for forming corporations or LLCs. Um, they're very interested in blockchain and states like Wyoming and Delaware and others are doing some things with blockchain. But one of the questions that um, I'm talking with them about and which may be on one of their future agendas for more discussion and I've agreed to give um, Leslie Reynolds, who's their executive director, the notes and a link to this discussion um, as well is uh, what about the corporations division? Could there be a way where software could form a corporation? There's a certain amount of data that's needed. You have to fill, usually a human on a web form, fill out the name of the corporation, um, the name and address of a person to serve process, a registered agent, 
um, who's on the board, uh, some things about the scope, if there's stock, what classes of stock are involved. You submit um, like $35 to more, you know, in a credit card and hit submit, and you get back, if, if all the fields are correct, um, a corporation with a, like a number, and it exists in a registry that the Secretary of State um, maintains, like a directory of all the then current corporations. I think this is where we, we want to focus, um, at least part of the dialogue here, is as a real practical matter, can we hack some software? Can we build and rapid prototype some software in collaboration with friends at the National Association of Secretaries of State, at least the ones that raise their hand and say, we want to play, we want to explore this, that would work hand in glove with their current um, web services that they use uh, as an interface for people to form corporations and LLCs. We think we can, and we think by rapid prototyping something like that as a result of the dialogue today, we'll learn a lot more about um, whether, whether we can do this now or whether there's a gap or some, some little wrinkle that we hadn't discovered yet, and that can feed back into be um, uh, more requirements or design goals that we could then do a second version of the software uh, to try to address. So with um, all of that as a kind of context setting, um, I want to introduce um, first Brendan Marr, uh, who's an MIT Media Lab alumni, and we also went to college together back in 1850 uh, years. Centuries ago. Centuries. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and uh, Brendan, why don't you introduce yourself, and then um, and then um, make the case for for software actually being a legal entity. Okay. Thank you very much, Daza. Thanks. If I had the first word for my talk, I'd be all set. <laughs> Hold it up to your mouth. There we go. Okay, um, so the first thing I want to say is that if you're following along, a little closer. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Wait, let me get the first word. I'll be much better. There we go. So this is going to be an action-packed talk, and if you're following the slides, I want you to know that later, uh, anything I don't cover, we can cover later on the panel, or you can talk to me um, later on. So my name is Brendan Marr. I am an MIT Media Laboratory alumnus from 19. 98, and I have a lot of experience in these types of systems. Satoshi granted us proof of experience, and most importantly, proof of existence. He showed us that he is, let me say this again. Why did I botch that up? Thanks. So th this is the story. So, Satoshi granted us proof of existence, but he did not grant us proof of identity. Now, this is a problem for automated and autonomous systems, because you can't sue Satoshi, okay? There is a bigger problem with automated and autonomous systems because they are something that can kill you, right? So what I propose is paying attention to jurisdiction. We want to have these things that are autonomous, have a jurisdiction, have them be registered. So my big proposal is that we have a consensus of risk, a consensus of safety risks, so that we take all of the things that are related to safety around these things and we have consensus around them, not just safety, but also their viability, right? Because we're talking about distributed and autonomous entities which have a life, right? So it could be viability in terms of their long-term livability. This relates to operational capital, right? You don't want these things to get stuck on a bridge because they don't have any money, right? So everything in that realm. There is another aspect to this, which is emergent dynamic law and emergent dynamic systems. Emergent dynamic systems and environments are problematic for automated and, uh, and distributed systems. Because we're working with contracts. We all know about them, the smart contracts. These contracts are deterministic. They are turning complete contracts. They have loops that are finite. But what happens when you take a emergent environment and you have random things that can happen, right? They can 
make those contracts become non-deterministic, and this is a problem. If it rains, do this. If it snows, do that. But if there's a hurricane, and you didn't plan for that, there's a problem. If this is an autonomous or automated system that's a real-time system, then you can kill somebody, right? So these things are, are, are really important. So what you want to be able to bear mind to and you want to be able to do is to have a cryptographic representation or representations of these things. You want to have a reason, reasoning about the safety of these things and their viability. You want to know that they have safety systems in place. However, you can't guarantee for sure mathematically that they are going to be safe, right? Because nobody could do that. But you want to know at least there's a system. So how do you do this? You have cryptographic representations such as multi-sig signatures that do proof of authority. You have hashing. You can do hashing of algorithms, hashing of data sets. This is not just related to autonomous entities, but it's also related to DAOs and governments and artificial intelligence. You can have zero knowledge proofs. There's all sorts of different kinds of algorithms that we have now, that we will have in the future, that allow for this to happen in a deterministic way for non-deterministic events. You're all lawyers, and what I want to just remind and share is that this is not Excel. It's not Excel at all. This is the hardest part of computing. It's real-time systems. Lawyers tend to think in terms of clauses that are about the future and clauses about the past. But this is it's the stuff in the middle, the really hard stuff. Okay? Now, the good thing is that there's a lot of geeks out there that actually know how to do this really well. Okay? It's actually a relatively small subset. But they're the ones who are doing the autonomous cars and the, the rockets that can self-dock without human intervention. Okay? So there are people who know how to do this. Don't tread on the First and Fourth Amendment. It's really important. Keep your smart contracts simple. Make them so that they're relative to safety and also to viability. Don't get caught up in what will be a potential problem about infringement on First and Fourth Amendment, because this is, this is going to play out over this next year and coming years. We're all in the same cubicle together. And you know, quite frankly, computational law is exciting. And all the lawyers are now geeks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Frank. Awesome. Thanks. So let's hold questions until Silk has um, said her piece, and then what we really want to do is circle up and have a conversation. So, uh, Silk? Oh, so um, there are actually a few countries, um, or there is at least one country where I've seen that has given person, um, legal uh, personality to smart contract systems, or what they call um, innovative technological arrangement, and that's Malta. I don't think they've done it that well, um, but they've actually made an attempt, attempt at this uh, last year. Um, I'm not happy with the regulation, but I'd be happy to see other states to actually work on this. So the issue is why I'm not happy about what they've done. So they've actually like, um, in their le le legislation, they passed three acts, one of them is relevant to this, uh, set out that uh, decentralized autonomous organization or smart contracts um, are subject to this, so it can be kind of be added to some register, and although it's not 
set out in the act itself saying um, this uh, DAO or smart contract is going to have legal uh, personality. That's what basically it does. Um, the thing is, how does it do it? It's using the old methods of what we already know, like the kind of traditional um, ways to go through intermediaries. So instead of having this in the, like a lean um, new regulation where you have like a self-owning smart contract or smart contract system or DAO, you have all these other parties that are involved in this. So you have someone is the applicant, um, who could be the, uh, the designer or some other legal entity that needs to submit uh, the application to be like certified to have this uh, ITA, inno Innovative Technological Arrangement, certified. Then you have, you need some um, resident agent who looks after this, you need a technical administrator, and all these people basically are intermediaries that make that system very expensive. In addition, this technical administrator who has to be appointed has to have a backdoor to uh, like a kill switch, um, an amendment key um, to the innovative technological arrangement, and that's basically n most of the things that are built in the space right now, not really a good idea. So um, having spoken to the um, regulator, they actually, they make some, they have these guidance notes and in those guidance notes they said, yeah, we just realized, okay, that seems to be a problem. Um, a lot of the systems don't wanna have this kill switch where the regulator com comes in and changes all the things. So, well, maybe for some things you don't need it. So if the consumer protection doesn't require it, then maybe we'll consider not to have it. In addition, every time you make a change, so for example, we have um, given the, the auctioneering power of the Dutch X exchange um, to this DHX DAO, are we in the process of doing that? I mean, the point of doing that is that the auctioneer can change things. So if we were in Malta, we would need the regulator for every single code change you make to the system, would need to have an approval for it, which is a cumbersome project. Pro project. So because of this, um, I think the Malta framework is being used it is being used, but not as much as it could. It's super expensive. Um, and I don't know that many projects that actually considered for this, for like a smart contract or DAO to be based there. But it's a good start. And I mean, they made an attempt to give legal personality to, um, to code, basically. So um, yeah, there are other um, options. I don't think I. Should, uh, what are the other options? So uh, they are also. I mean, I think on the topic of Malta, uh, like, I mean, I don't know the, all the details, but yeah. So I'm Danny from uh, Dow Incubator and Pando. But uh, after this technological arrangement law came out, there was the Max Ganado, who was one of the person who wrote this. He wrote the Ganado Doctrine, and so I don't know the details, but they are unveiling a fourth uh, uh, DAO law that will give also those like. Uh, uh, legal personality that is distinct from the idea of the technological arrangement because it assumed agency uh, on a person and not agency of the DAO on its own. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I don't know what's, what they're going to unveil. It's going to be in less than a month, but I know they are uh, evolving on this framework. So, they're going to publish it within the next month, you say? Yes. So the, it's going to be the Malta Blockchain Summit, and they're on the website of the event. Yeah. They said they're going to uh, unveil it, the Prime Minister, or whatever, yeah. uh, <laughs> during that. So, yeah. There's a link to that paper. On the, there's a link to that paper on the paper that I have associated with this. Perfect. So if you go back to the event site, um, I'll, I'll add all of those links. All the materials are in our GitHub repository where the event site is, but <clears throat> look there for the links and also come up afterwards and ask for more information. What is going on here? We're, I had to ask for feedback, but not this. What's the party tonight? Um, okay. Um, so let's let's open it up now. Um, qu questions, comments. Um, you first. You want to meet me halfway? Okay. Thanks. 
Uh, so just uh, as a bit of a background, I'm a corporate attorney who specializes in formation of new companies. Um, and uh, I, I tend to think that the, uh, the ability to create a separate legal, legal personality, at least in the US, is leavened by certain, uh, certain ways that the corporate veil can be pierced if the entity is used for, for evil. Um, so if the entity is fundamentally undercapitalized, um, or is used for some other bad purpose. And to me, that's sort of the natural trade-off. We allow people to create separate legal entities and limit their own personal liability in exchange for certain measures to actually grab at them if they misuse this particular legal structure. Um, and I think that's fair. Um, so, you know, what mechanisms would you suggest to have fail-safes for situations where people use these uh, legal personhoods um, for evil. Okay. I, I can get us started on that. That's an excellent question. Um, do you mind holding on to that and handing it yes, to the sure. next person? Thanks. You're all deputized. Um, so what was rattling around the back of my, my head when uh, Silk gave the lunch talk and shared with us the international principles, including for legal personality for DAOs, um, the principle that a DAO should, should be liable for you know, its own actions got me thinking about what types of um, almost public policy trade-offs would be appropriate and where would this liability allocation make sense um, in a more holistic legal framework. And what it called to mind was in the 90s when uh, public key infrastructure was coming on strong with the advent of um, wide use of public key certificates and uh, certification authorities. Um, I was uh, active in the American Bar Association Information Security Committee, and we'd worked with uh, the state of Utah and some other states to draft digital signature legislation that um, included liability limitations for um, certain parties, like the certification authority, for example, um, so long as it abided by um, its published rules for identifying a party and associating a public key with them. Well, it turned out we were too rash in creating um, legislation. It was too early and we didn't fully understand how that market was going to develop or what all the relationships and risks are and how they could more fairly be allocated. Um, one of the criticisms of that is what called to mind by a guy named Brad Biddle was, well, if you're going to limit the liability of a party or cause a party to be liable for something, there maybe also should be a concept of like a capital reserve. So for example, if one says as a principle, a DAO or other automated entity would be liable for certain types of actions, like let's just postulate for a moment that we provided them legal entity status. Maybe one of the types of um, circuit breakers could be, and it must have proportional insurance, bonding, risk reserve pool, that's um, kind of you know, commensurate or proportional to the risks that it is taking. You know, that way people could have recourse and could be made whole again. So thinking about some of those types of mechanisms to ensure the fairness of a coherent and complete legal framework, I think is, um, that's the work before us now. Um, more, uh, or uh, other comments on that? Okay, great. Um, yeah, sure, I've got a few comments. One is that uh, for certain things, um, you do wanna have a, a registration and, and, and a kill switch. Um, and this comes up, you know, it's not just blockchain or finance, it's also in other areas, uh, in other domains, biology, right? These are the same issues that we are facing in uh, genetics. Kevin Els Elsflat is doing work with that, with uh, tech idea and construct around gene drives, right? Having uh, kill switches for um, biological entities. So th these are the themes of the day. Uh, and you're speaking to the uh, like the synth bio yes. and like manufactured yes. biologic entities, not the result of natural evolution. Correct. Yes. Great. Uh, other comments on this? No. No. I mean, I, I wanted to s I wanted also to speak about the reserve structure. Please. So basically, I mean, what you would have to have is uh, for the DAOs. I mean, you would. I mean, the moment you do this, um, the legislation would have to consider how to protect the consumers, and one way of doing that, basically, through uh, for the entity to have sufficient assets proportionate to what they're doing. 
Um, but it would be, uh, I, I think we need to get, need to stop looking only at like the approach we've taken for years, which is going through intermediaries and like the system has changed. It's just a different technology. It needs different solutions and you cannot just do the same thing we've done before. So I think there should be self-owning um, contracts, smart contracts or DAOs that have personality. Great. Um, other um, questions or ideas? Yes. Uh, there was a clarification on the um, notion of the safety spell switch. So I, I feel like the argument you're making about like complex behavior coming from like basic atomic units, you could not only look at in smart contracts, but like in normal contracts. So like the basic uh, atomic unit of the society is the law that then kind of creates this thing called society, which is chaotic and emergent. And we see this also applied, for example, this complex system design in the social management and social credit uh, system in China. And I understand what you mean by having it being autonomous. It means it's like immutable and unstoppable and nobody can restrict it. So my question is that, uh, are you advocating for uh, a limitation of autonomy via this uh, safety mechanisms? Mr. Song, yes. Uh, that is an excellent question. And it really depends on w what the use of these are. We don't want to get into a situation where we're micromanaging all the code, right? Because then we're treading on our free speech and the Fourth Amendment, right? Search and seizure. So there has to be a balance, okay? It's clear to me, and I wasn't a person who initially thought, oh, we should you know, have registration for things. I was actually against that. But then I started realizing that you know, once for certain things people start to die, somebody's gonna say we need to register something. So we better start to think about this. But it's very important that we just don't blindly say, start saying that everything needs to be registered. Because the fact is, is that Blockchains and all these technologies are software. And, you know, that, that could be a problem for free speech. Um, hey, Ori, I, I'm about to call on you just you know, so you start coming this direction, uh, but I think you're the next question. Oh. Uh, just to expand on this conversation, a corporation sometimes needs to be dissolved or needs to be shut down or wound down. Is there something built in? Because you know, thinking of the kill switch is something you know, like something terrible is happening is one way. But there may be another where you may want to just decide as a group that you need to cease the functioning of the organization. So how do you do that? Yeah. Well, uh, that's governance, right? No, no one said that these things don't have governance. The question is, for the governance they have, you know, at what point is it is it registered? At what point is it centralized? to a jurisdiction, right? And there's gonna be lots of different forms of these things. I can make a club, and that club can be a decentralized organization. Am I going to have to register my, you know, my club for the SEC or any other body? It really depends on what these things do. Here, here. You know, it reminds me, the first time I ever saw MIT Media Lab, Brendan and I uh, were um, we, we had clubs. You had the virtual reality club, and I had the um, legal interest group of Boston Computer Society. We teamed up to do a joint meeting, and um, we talked about VR and you know avatars and AI and law. And one of the ideas that came out of that session, when we were actually talking about this topic, like should they have legal personality? Should you know, would, can these things actually be like you know legal entities? Was um, I think I had said, well, what if we had like a license plate? equivalent on them. So, right. you know, we know what license plates are. We kind of know the role that they serve to connect a, an object now that can itself be an autonomous right. uh, with autonomous vehicles to a legal party and there's a registry somewhere you can do a lookup, but we don't regulate where exactly you can drive, but we have some proportional um, touch point to have a directory and to attribute the acts of you know, hardware or software in this case to legal parties and to legal mechanisms like risk reserve pools or car insurance or whatever. Um, Steve, just kidding. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Greg Shatton. Um, Greg. And I'm asking this with neither hat on that I had before, but as a participant in uh, ICANN, internet governance, and especially 
um, dealing lately with um, the issues of the who is domain registration database yeah. and the effect that GDPR has an, had on it. And so I think by analogy, the domain name registration database, which is a privately governed um, set of data that's collected each time somebody registers for a domain name and which until May 25th of last year was basically open data yeah. um, and then on May 25th suddenly became redacted for privacy on a, almost a global basis. Right. So, but, but still available uh, upon, you know. 96% had not even been responded to. The, the, the information is now privately in the hands of each individual registrar or registry and most of them respond poorly, if at all, to most requests for information. And it's not at all automated. Uh, there's discussion now of an automated and accredited access model. That'll take about a year, year and a half, maybe, to, to re resolve. Um, but I think there's a lot could be learned, both good and bad, lessons learned, from the conversation that's being had, the dialogue that's being had at ICANN around how you deal with the data governance of personal data that has been collected, um, in, in this case, over 20 years. Uh, but there, the challenge, the GDPR challenge is, is huge, and depending upon the stakeholders you listen to, global privacy is not only the most important thing, it's the only important thing, and who is is a terrible idea, and nobody should have any access to it ever. Um, other people feel differently. But there is, when it's part, as soon as you start getting a lot of different stakeholders in the conversation, and the, remember the bottom line idea of GDPR is that the data belongs to the subject. Right. Um, so you have a lot of issues here about how you actually can maintain databases uh, of information on a private level, because GDPR does allow governments to collect all kinds of information that private organizations can't. So unless you're, and so that creates an issue for, for, for ICANN that, let's say, the New York State Department of Motor Vehicles does not have. Got it. So um, just a quick um, check. How, I know you have a question. Um, who else is, is busting with a question? So I guess my, my question is, have you thought about kind of okay. the, the issues that come out of this and, and the kind of the interaction between GDPR and other privacy rules and collecting this data in a way that would be made available and by whom and to whom and when? I can speak a little bit to that, although I'd like to hear from others. Um, and, um, uh, your question, and then I've asked Ori to come up to talk to us about a, a state statute in Vermont where they're already moving toward um, blockchain-based LLCs, um, and he's building a system that I think um, would be a good, a good um, starting point as we get into our breakout groups. But um, some musings on what you just said, Greg, um, are um, number one, there is a, um, so I, I was an arbitrator for many years in the UDRP, which is the domain name versus trademark dispute resolution process. So that would be an example that continues today where if you're a accredited registrar, you know, incapable of assigning domain names, one of the things you have to do is um, respond to uh, this kind of very structured complaint process if a, tr if a registered trademark holder believes someone that's a registered domain holder is infringing their trademark. There's a form you fill out and it starts this process. So that's not the same as a public registry where you can see the, you know, the name and the telephone number and address of everybody, but it does respond to due process and it responds to, um, you know, to a need to know. Same thing with, with um, license plates, actually. If you get someone's license plate and you know, the insurer needs to find out you know, who's responsible, for example, um, you know, there's a process to do that without rendering you know, naked everybody that's in the registry. But as you said, I think the most important thing is, um, actually the other one I'll, I'll name is lawyers. And so, you know, I, um, as a, once, when, once I had a law license for other public policy reasons that balance um, with privacy, um, it's felt that my name and my address and my current status of like active practice, have I had any um, like uh, malpractice against me, those types of consumer protection notices, I have had no malpractice, um, were, were publicly available in a lookup. So I think there's several gradations, but what you're saying is very much essential to, I think, Brendan's main point, which is we have to have some way to register these artificial entities, and, and there has to be and I think that should be a core component of our thinking going forward. That should be one of the design challenges that we try to solve for. And part of the way to solve for it is to address the, um, the wrinkles that you're bringing up. The data governance up front really needs to be data governance by design 
that's built in, and not just privacy by design, but also access by design. Amen. Um, so I think you're next. Um, do you, can you grab a mic from anybody? And who are you? D Hi, I'm Diana Stern. I work at Baker Hostetler. So I'll start with my questions. You can think about it, and then I'll give a little bit of context. So my question is, what do you think is a minimum viable DAO? So both from like a legal perspective and a technical perspective. And from a legal perspective, I'm thinking of it like when you think of the downside of liability, and we can limit it to the US, if you're not proactive in setting up a structure and setting up contractual agreements, then you fall into that unincorporated partnership situation with nobody liked, because eventually, if you can't collect from the DAO itself, you're going to go to the people running the nodes or whatever. And then from a technical perspective, what's the minimum viable DAO? Like, do you start on a permission network or like a permission network that other people can see so you have some accountability, like a public permission, or you just go like full <laughs> Ethereum, or do you start on the test network of a public Ethereum? So I just would like to get some thoughts on kind of what is the minimum viable DAO from those perspectives. Um, so from a legal perspective, um, minimum viable DAO would probably be, I mean, just to, to, to understand your question fully, it's basically, you want to see how you can build a DAO which is legally compliant. So that you avoid those worst case scenarios happening. Yeah. Like, what is the bare minimum we kind of need so that we're not worried about being sued as individuals for what the DAO does. So, so the easiest way to do it, and it very much depends on the purpose of your DAO, and I think Beth is going to do a really nice workshop upstairs about this uh, later. Um, so you would want to do, you would want to have an anchor in a jurisdiction, because as I said, if you do not have an anchor, you can be sued anywhere on the planet, basically in any country, because they by a private international law, they basically um, draw you into your jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So to make it the easiest, you would go probably for, um, you could, for example, as I earlier said, you go for a company limited by guarantee in the UK. I think you have something similar here in the US where there aren't any members. It's used usually for charities or cooperatives. Um, you would then have the company register of this isn't public. You could put that on a blockchain. You just, the, the downside of that is, and I found this out only two days ago, is that you basically have to have a board. And of course, the board can have liability. So what you want to do in that situation is have a DNO insurance. So I think this would probably be the minimum viable DAO where you have, you need an anchor through either a company or something. Um, there will be some directors um, or board of directors or similar guarantors or whatever you, you use, um, and they would need an insurance. I think this would be the base. There's also another thing in the US which is really interesting if you want to do one here is that through some legal, bad legal drafting, you can actually create a zero member LLC. So um, what happens is that uh, the moment, you know, it, it's possible that for, so they allow, and I'm really not an expert on US law, but they allow 90 days um, for you to have a, not a member in your LLC, but there's nothing to, after those 90 days, to kind of struck it out. So you can just go on, you have a perpetual zero member LLC, and that would be perfect for a DAO, I think. I mean, you know, because the, the, the LLC owns itself because there's no member. Um, I, I would assume they'd probably get rid of this sometime. <laughs> well, and speaking of, um, of LLCs and blockchain, and what would be like minimum, uh, maybe requirements and constraints uh, that you'd want to build in at you know design phase, um, Ori's uh, been working um, diligently on this, and you're, you're as far along as anyone I've met yeah, before. I can, I can answer quickly from the technical perspective. I think the minimum viable DAO is just a multi-sig, and so we already see thousands of these, and you know, if you have a three of five multi-sig, it's a DAO. It's an on-chain decision process for uh, budgeting funds and making decisions, so executing any arbitrary transaction on the Ethereum blockchain, for example. Even on Bitcoin, uh, you can do, it, it supports uh, multi-sig, so you can have a DAO on Bitcoin. And so you already see 
these like more complex uh, protocols being built on Bitcoin just on the basis of um, convoluted ways of uh, ordering multi-sig transactions. And then that can, yeah, that kind of transitions into the project I'm working on, which right now we are just a multi-sig, and so we are operating as, as a DAO, um, but we realized really quickly that there's legal liability issues. Like, like you're saying, um, we are all have like unlimited joint and several liability for all of the DAO's actions and its deaths. Um, so what w the route we've been going is working with um, a firm in Vermont to stand our stand ourselves up as a BBLLC and then also transition to a more complex on-chain mechanism. So instead of just a multi-sig, having a DAO stack DAO be the, the back end. And and can you unpack a yeah. BBLLC? Like what's yeah, going so, on in Vermont? Yeah, sure. So I think it was in July they passed a law that is called, um, well, part of it is the blockchain-based LLC. And the idea is that you could kind of, uh, like Silky was saying, like just anchor your DAO or smart contract into the legal system. So what it would look like in practice is uh, you'd have an operating agreement that just specifies a smart contract as the mechanism for distributing and changing ownership and governance. And so you just have a really, really lightweight uh, contract on the legal side that kind of specifies who the administrative participant is, the person who's going to be served notices, who's going to pay taxes, um, who's going to have a mailing address on the books. And then that person doesn't necessarily need to have any um, claims on equity or special privileges that the potentially thousands of other members of the DAO don't, don't have. So, so yeah, you can have um, an operating, and we're, we're going through the steps right now, and so we're really right in the middle of it, so I don't really know completely what, how it's going to look, but we, we're, we're designing it like, very intentionally so that there's no um, a, like centralization vector, so that the, the linkage that the smart contract system has with the legal system isn't a vulnerability for, that compromises the autonomy, as Danny was talking about, of the DAO, so that a kill switch wouldn't be necessary. You would just have um, all, all operation, governance, ownership, decisions delegated on chain. Can I? Uh, um, I just want to clarify one thing and then right back to you. So what part of what um, Ori is talking about, and we, actually, we have a version of it here that's marked up, and I think we'll, probably one of our breakout groups will be focused on this, um, on this project that Ori is talking about. Uh, but you literally can go to the Secretary of State's office in Vermont now, and one of the types of LLCs you could select uh, based on this recently enacted statute is the blockchain-based LLC. And um, among other, th so there's one part of the workflow that I just want to highlight, which is these steps with the Secretary of State. You pay your fee to, to create and form the LLC, um, and you have some minimum terms in there, and we're just kind of going through the statute like over the last couple of days to see what those are, but there's um, the, the blockchain address where you could find um, the smart contract with the um, uh, operating rules that are yeah, incorporated like by the, reference. The, the way that you change what contract you're pointing to, so maybe the contract itself could have mechanisms for swapping out which contract is the governance, or you could define in a legal process um, how you would switch from this multi-sig to a DAO stack DAO to an Aragon DAO. Yeah, so I uh, just want to highlight that. Um, follow up. Yeah, so is, I'm curious, is the government doing anything to interface better with the technical aspects of what you're building? Like, you know, messaging in different kinds of ways instead of like attaching documents to emails, are they doing anything that's progressive on that front? Yeah, not, not that I know of. The most useful thing they could do would be to have a, an Ethereum address for paying taxes because that, then that, we can build a module to automate our, ta our taxation so we can be tracking kind of our, our income and using the tax rates to automate the paying of taxes. Right now you would need that administrative participant to then have, some, have the DAO vote to give the administrative participant the amount of taxes that the entity is, is due. And that's uh, like a, a point of potential contention that the DAO could decide not to pay its taxes. I guess, and so one, one thing you could do to prevent this, you talk about kind of designing systems so that they d don't run into these problems is that you could, you could create like a module on the DAO or an additional like uh, function or contract that is, is setting aside these taxes that then go to the administrative participant that they can then pay the state with. Good stuff. Silk. 
Yeah, I want to say something else to the minimum viable DAO. What you would also want to do is that um, the members, you, you need to set up or you should set up in a contractual um, agreement uh, for the, in, in that participation agreement he just mentioned, you would also want to have a dispute resolution mechanism for the members inside because that's easy to regulate. Uh, you would want to have it to be a closed off system so that you don't, we have enough problems with third parties, so try to make it so that you don't have any problems with um, the other members. For example, you'd build in waivers, indemnifications, um, and like an arbitration um, system, which can even be on-chain, because there are now some on-chain system. So I would try to also include a dispute um, an feature. Internal, an internal dispute. An internal one, so if that you have to, you know, to, to kind of have a, only a m minimum um, anchor to the state through like arbitration where you can che check, you can choose your rules um, of applicable law, you can often not do that in state law and have an on-chain arbitration system that is enforceable in the real world, but basically make it close to off. Yeah, and there's, there's protocols out there like Kleros that do peer-to-peer, -peer, which is probably what you're referring to, peer-to-peer -peer arbitration. So one option is to have a, like a function in your contract that you know if someone claims that decision the DAO made was against its uh, agreement with the DAO, that it could yeah, delegate to this arbitration network. Or if, if your DAO is, is well enough configured, it can all, all the arbitration can be internal to the DAO. Like you could say, if there's a, if there's a dispute with the like, um, small decision making that happens, you, you take it to a majority or super majority vote to the DAO to, to, to resolve the dispute. And that way you just, yeah, like you're saying, minimize the interfacing that has to happen with the legal system. There's also reality, reality TO, and Zeros, and I forgot. Aragon Court. Aragon, yes, that one is also very good. And Dash does a lot of stuff. for all of the DAOs. And so from all of these DAOs, they randomly draw jurors and you can basically upload a proposal agreement, which is like, these are the agreements we go with. And so uh, you can basically contest exactly, it's kind of based on Kleros, but the difference with Kleros is that Kleros is basically general. You can point into any smart contract or escrowing, and this is for a digital jurisdiction of DAO of DAOs. So. DAO of DAOs. Um, so we're just about to wrap up, um, but why don't we make this the last question? Can you grab the uh, mic? So not a question. I, I made the statement. LLC for on the legal end. Uh, so I can tell you how, um, how to do it. Can you say it into the mic? Yeah, so I made a BBLLC on the legal end. Um, so I can briefly explain how that works. Um, but, okay, but can I ask? So we're, the next thing we're going to do is break into smaller groups. So let's have a group, um, or maybe we can hijack slightly your group um, okay. that you're doing with the, um, the DAP agreement. But um, I know we, some of us want to continue the discussion about um, DAOs and legal entities, but um, time doesn't completely permit. Um, so can we uh, put that forward to the breakouts? And let me ask, is there any, any final um, things that people on the panel would like to say? Brendan. Sure, this is uh, related to human in the loop. So there are times when a human in the loop becomes necessary. Oddly enough, uh, in my discussions with Beth, it, it turned out that thinking about these, not from the life or birth of a company, but from the death, is kind of useful, right? Looking at it in terms of bankruptcy and what happens when you reverse the process. So I'll leave you with that. Right. Here, here, for life cycle analysis. Um, okay, so let's, uh, how about a round of applause for all the panelists? Nice. We're making progress.